Okay, so my um, talk it really ties in with Ben's presentation and um, it's basically talking about drench resistance but this is a bit more of a local perspective um, from the tests that I was involved in in our Hume region. So there's a picture of me looking way too happy about collecting faeces. Um, so at the start of 2012, uh, Zoetis Animal Health, which used to be called Pfizer Animal Health, and um, Hume LHPA, we got together uh, and ran a number of drench trials just across our local region. So again, there may be a little bit of bias in terms of the farms that participated because we promoted the trials and um, farmers volunteered to be involved. So this is, um, for those who don't know, a, a just a map of the Hume region, what our boundaries are. And I've just made a little cross um, to show where the farms were that uh, participated in our trials. So as you can see, there's a pretty good distribution sort of around the um, central region of our authority. So I won't spend too long on this because I know um, that Ben's gone through it, but basically um, a drench resistance trial is the same as a faecal or a worm egg count reduction test and it allows you to trial a number of different drenches uh, at once on your property and find out which ones are working and which ones aren't working anymore for one or more species of worms. And um, I hope that by the end of Ben's presentation, my presentation, you'll see that it is really valuable to do once every two to three years, even though it does take a little bit of effort. So uh, just to give you a quick um, run through of how we did our trials and it's going to tie in with the workshops this afternoon. We um, primarily, in fact exclusively used undrenched weaners because they tend to be the wormiest mob of sheep. They tend to be the most consistently wormy across the mob. and. Um, we didn't break up the eggs, uh, egg counts per species, but we just wanted to see an overall egg count of 200 eggs per gram based on an initial screening of 10 animals. And uh, most farms saved around sort of 90 head of weaners for us to do the trials. Um, it varied a little bit depending on how many drenches we were testing. So uh, when we go out to the farm, we put sheep um, randomly into groups of 12 to 15 head and um, each group was given a different drench and then um, we had that one group that was left as a control. We put different coloured ear tags in their ear to identify them and then they were drafted by the ear tags, they were weighed and um, they were dosed exactly according to their body weight with the drench that matched their ear tag. And, um, as an aside, when I was looking for a picture of ear tags, I found this one, which is from the ABC, and it was from a guy in Broken Hill whose lifelong passion is collecting sheep ear tags. And he had thousands, I've forgotten how many. <laughs> so we went back to each farm about 10 to 14 days uh, after we did the initial setup and um, we collected faeces from 10 animals per group. The reason we started with 12 to 15 um, was because some always empty out completely by the time you can get to them. And um, so every animal was sampled and we took the faeces directly from the rectum to make sure it was really accurate. And this is Stuart who we work with and he's the animal health ranger and um, I thought this picture was particularly dodgy because he'd grown a moustache for Movember and he's doing the faecal sampling. So um, all our um, testing at the lab was done at the Veterinary Health Research Laboratory at Armadale, um, it's similar to the testing that's done here at the CSU. And um, basically egg counts were done for every animal in every group and um, the eggs were then hatched into larva and the proportion of um, each worm species was, was calculated. Uh, so as Ben explained, basically the uh, treatment groups are compared with the control and the percentage reduction is an indication of the drench efficacy, which is basically the, the kill rate. And um, anything that has more than 5% of the worm surviving based on the egg counts is considered to be ineffective drenching and um, drench resistance. So we didn't, because this was a local um, study and we were trying to fit in with the drenches that the farmers specifically wanted to test, um, we didn't sort of standardise drenches between properties, but there were some that were used on, on most. Um, Ivermectin was used on all 25 farms. Uh, Startex, which is Zoetis's new um, product, which is just in the 
process of getting registration. Uh, it's got Durquantil in it, which is a novel molecule along with abamectin, and um, that was trialled on all the farms as well. Cydectin was trialled on almost all properties. Uh, Ramatin combination was trialled on most, and then the rest was basically a split between either an abamectin triple or a, um, a white clear double combination. Then there was just a couple of odds and sods. So we really just concentrated on the three um, main species of, of worms that are of importance uh, to sheep properties. We did actually have 15 farms that had a significant barber's pole population, which um, it does tend to be more a sporadic problem in our region, but perhaps because we had such a wet 2012, we actually did have a few properties with barber's pole. So um, what was the story in the Hume region? So I've separated this according to um, worm species. So the small brown stomach worm, this is really the worm that historically developed resistance the quickest and has had the most resistance to the most drenches. And um, resistance to uh, white and clear drenches has been around since the 80s. And as you can see, almost all properties had resistance in the small brown stomach worm um, to, to the white clear drench. The, um, the story with the Ramatin combination drench is a little bit complicated in that it, it didn't work effectively on about half the properties, um, but actually there's not a lot of published reports on Ramatin resistance in the small brown stomach worm. In fact, there are none in Australia. And um, so whether this is true resistance, um, I've spoken to Rob Woodgate about it, or whether it's just the variability of this drench. We know that sometimes it works really well and other times it doesn't. It's much more effective against adult parasites than it is against juveniles. So um, it may be a factor of the variability of that drench, um, not pure resistance. Um, <coughs> the story with ivermectin is, um, it is a bit sad. I think the last, um, for our particular region in 2007, I think the prevalence was reported as 30%. And I think the very first reports came out in, in 2000. We, although we had a small sample size, we actually had a much higher um, prevalence. So 65%, that basically means if you look around at the two people sitting next to you, two out of the three of you are gonna have ivermectin resistance in, in the small brown stomach worm population. The, um, the cydectin actually performed a bit better than what Ben was um, describing, but I think that it's a, a good take home point that cydectin is really widely used. It's so convenient. It's in Wiener Garden long acting formulations, but um, if you're one of those 9% of properties that's resistant, it's a, it is a real significant issue. So um, the black scow worm, it sort of showed a similar resistance pattern. We're a little bit surprised uh, actually how well the white and clear combination performed because again resistance has been around since the 80s to whites and clears. Um, Steve, our, our vet in Albury, thought perhaps it was to do with its limited use in recent years but um, we certainly wouldn't be recommending it in a drench rotation <laughs> program. Uh, again, the Naphthalophos um, didn't work that well on about a third of properties and um, again it could be a variability issue. There is one published report in Australia of um, resistance in the black scow worm to Naphthalophos. Um, there's no reason why Ramatin combination which includes a white and clear should not perform as well as a straight white and clear and I think it's more to do with just the um, sample size um, of, of each treatment. The um, this emerging new issue of ivermectin resistance in the black scow worm is something that we found in our local study and, um, and at the moment we're in discussions to do more research on it to further understand it. The thing that is um, unlucky for us is it actually does seem to be a problem that's targeting or that's, that has shown up really in the Riverina. So it is, um, it is sort of very real for us. And um, with the barber's pole, you can see that the mectins, um, it was just huge resistance to the mectins. But in terms of the levamazole, I think our barber's pole is a bit better behaved than the barber's pole in the New England because um, those wrenches worked pretty well. 
so this is just an example. This was on a particular farm that participated in our drench trials. Now this farm, it's a big property. It has 10,000 sheep. I did changed management. Um, they had a terrible worm problem. The merino, they were merino wieners and they just looked terrible. They were ill thrifty, scouring, just weren't growing. Some, some died. Uh, so they were given cydectin at weaning and then they set aside 90 wieners for us to use in the trial. These um, were the faecal egg counts that we got. So, um, and they didn't have barber's pole, tends to be the one that really produces a lot of eggs and actually they hardly had any barber's pole. So the worm counts were, were pretty high. Out of the control group, which wasn't treated, the maximum was 3,440 and the average was 1,848. Uh, there are the, the drench treatment groups sitting along the control column and um, there are worms, worm eggs that have come through, I don't know how to use the pointer, but they've come through in the um, ivermectin groups and also in the white clear groups. There's still significant numbers of eggs left over after, um, after they were uh, treated with those drenches. So this is what the lab gives us. They give us a um, table which shows for each worm species what the drench efficacy was. And as you can see, ivermectin performed pretty poorly uh, for all three species of, of worm. And um, the white clear didn't perform very well against the small brown stomach worm. And um, the naphthalophos combination was sort of on the, on the border. So the advice we gave to this particular producer, he wanted to put um, the sheep out onto crop pastures that he'd prepared and were clean pastures. He wanted to make sure that they were completely, um, you know, reducing the contamination as much as possible. So we actually recommended Zolvix because it was something that hadn't been used recently. He'd never used it before. So he used Zolvix as his first summer drench. And um, we recommended based on those results um, that he should rotate between the novel molecule, so Zolvix Startect when it gets registered, the Abermectin triples or Q-Drench. Uh, the Cydectin was still working okay on this property and, um, and we did say that it could be included but certainly you'd want to be doing the drench check at 10 days just to make sure that, that it was staying effective because it is in the same, same family as Ivermectin. So on the uh, second farm, it was a slightly different, um, bit of a happier situation. All the wieners looked pretty healthy. On this farm, he commonly used wiener garden cydectin yearly in his drench program. And uh, again, he set 90 wieners aside for us to use in our trial. So as you can see, the worm counts were nowhere near as high. Uh, but sufficient for us to do the, the worm test. What you can see here is both the ivermectin and the moxidectin or cydectin had worm eggs coming through after the treatment. And um, with this drench efficacy table, uh, you can see that there's significant resistance to both ivermectin and cydectin in the black scour worm and small brown stomach worm. And what's interesting with that is they had a completely susceptible barber's pole population and about a third of their worm burden was barber's pole. So if anything, you'd expect it to be the other way around based on our results. So it's, um, it just shows that it's not predictable. It, it, you know, results you don't actually know until, until you test it on an individual farm. So the advice we gave um, to this farm was to stay away from the MLs altogether. I mean, unless he came back with having a 100% barber's pole um, worm burden, we, we told him to completely steer clear, to rotate between those other drenches that I spoke about previously and um, to monitor with the drench checks. So um, we'll talk more about that in the workshop this afternoon, but the, the 10 to 14 days is the, the perfect period because it means that any new larva that they're picking up doesn't have enough time to develop and then be laying eggs themselves. So you're getting a true, uh, you're getting a true indication of how effective that drench was in, in killing off the worms. So in this case, um, the farmer was, was really genuinely surprised because he thought Cydectin had been working really well. And um, I think in this case it would have been causing production loss and um, no doubt economic loss, uh, but there wasn't clinical signs of disease and so it had sort of flown under the radar. The other thing that this problem would be uh, causing would be contamination of, past, uh, of the pastures with resistant larvae. So the idea behind um, our summer drenching program is basically to limit 
uh, this time of year around July to limit that peak of larval contamination on the pasture. So for the two worm species um, that really affect our region, the small brown stomach worm and black scow worm, um, this is the you know this is when you get your peak um, larval contamination on the pasture. So the black line shows what happens if you don't drench at all. The red line is showing what happens if you give an ineffective summer drench. So that would be like the last property I was talking about using Cydectin. You'd be getting contamination of the pasture. Not only would there be contamination, but you'd get contamination of a population of resistant worms. And what we're aiming for is the blue line, which is to use a drench, which is going to be effective um, to get rid of the worm burden and also reduce the, the pasture contamination. So in summary from, from our studies, um, we found the whites and clears have reached the end of the line, which was no surprise. Uh, and that phthalophos combination drenches, they're still useful on some properties and they're, they're actually really valuable because they're a completely different active. So it does give you another um, drench option. So I think provided you're doing the drench checks, they, they are a valuable rotation option. Um, Abamex and triples uh, we found were working uh, pretty well. We didn't find any resistance to the Abamex and triples on, on our small number of trials. And um, as Ben was saying, it's a good idea to introduce those novel compounds now um, so that it just helps prolong their life and, um, and reduces, the, minimises the development of resistance. So Ivermectin resistance is widespread in our region and it is it appears to be affecting all three main species of sheep worm. So um, as I mentioned before, we really need to do a bit more research in the ivermectin resistance in the, um, in the black scow worm. Uh, that should say black scow worm. <laughs> um, moxidectin resistance, although it wasn't high, um, it's certainly around and it is increasing. So final um, thoughts based on our, our little survey is um, that drench resistance can cause clinical disease uh, that's easy to detect, but it can also go unnoticed and be causing production and economic losses. Uh, regular monitoring with drench checks at day 10 uh, or 10 to 14 is really important as part of your general worm management program. Uh, the results of drench resistance trials are unique for each farm and we found really quite a lot of variation from farm to farm. So um, the results aren't always predictable and I think it's really valuable for you to do your own trial and um, that will guide you in terms of the drenches that are going to be effective and the best rotation to use for the next two to three years. And it's not just going to be um, a value for your property but for, for our sheep populations as a whole to, to keep the resistance minimised as best as we can. So thanks to everyone. <laughs> thanks, Amy.